Welcome to a very current events episode of Let's Flight Summit. And we're going to be talking about the Iskander, as NATO knows it, the SS-26 Stone. Uh, this missile is a short-range ballistic missile system. It was originally started in 1988 to succeed the infamous Scud missile. Uh, but because of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the turmoil that followed, it wasn't to 2006 that this missile system actually entered service. Now, there's three versions of this system. The E model is the export version. The K model includes cruise missiles. And the M model has two 9M723 ballistic missiles. Now, it's these 9M723s that we're going to be looking at for this episode. Now, the 9M723 missile comes in a few different versions itself. You've got one that carries a high explosive warhead, one that carries a high explosive penetrator, which is for hitting buried targets. You got submunitions, you got thermobaric, even got a nuclear warhead. So if you look around the internet, you're going to find some different values for dimensions and masses and stuff like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to go with a launch mass of 4,615 kilograms. We're going to max out the payload at 700 kilograms. And we're going to go with a length of 7.3 meters and a maximum diameter of 0.93 meters. Iskander is reported to have a maximum range of 500 kilometers. But take a look at that maximum reported altitude of 50 kilometers. There's something not right about that combination of numbers. You see, with a ballistic missile, when you're at your maximum range, there's only one trajectory that'll get you there. But if you're less than your maximum range, there's actually two. There's a high one, which we call lofted, and a low one, which we call depressed. Now, looking at the maximum velocity for this missile, it's 2,100 to 2,600 meters per second. We combine that with the launch mass, we can actually get this missile a lot further than 500 kilometers, upwards of 700 kilometers, according to our simulation. So what that's telling us is that the Iskander is flying a depressed trajectory. So why is it 500 kilometers then for our maximum range? Well, that's to make it compliant with the now defunct INF Treaty. Now your standard 9M723 missile has five sections in it. There's the nose, and that's going to contain the uh, radar seeker. Uh, there's a payload section, which is where your warhead, your submunitions, the fusing, all of that stuff's going to be. And there's going to be an instrument section behind that. It's going to have different types of avionics and power. And propulsion section is going to be made up entirely of the solid rocket motor. Now let's step back and look at the nose, payload, and instrument section. Look at that shape. Uh, we've got a rounded shape on the nose, which is actually the tangent ogive. We have a conic section for the payload and the instrument. What it turns out is when you have a cross-sectional area that varies with the body station on the missile, you can produce a lot of lift in it. When you combine these with the high speeds that this missile can attain, this thing is going to produce some lift and it's going to have some maneuverability. Another advantage of this shape lower radar cross-section from the front. The Iskander is going to use this to delay detection and cause problems tracking for any kind of ground-based air defense radar. The tail section on this missile is busy. First you have four aerodynamic fins which are used for steering and stability anytime during the flight. You also have four thrust vectoring vanes which are positioned right outside the rocket nozzle and they're used for steering during the boost phase of flight. Now a thrust vectoring vane is simply just an aerodynamic fin but it's made of a high temperature resistant material and it works against the high speed flow of the rocket motor. You've probably also noticed there are several other objects on the base of this missile and they're more than likely countermeasures. It is reported the 9M723 does carry radar countermeasures and putting them on the base of the missile is a pretty good place to have them. Now for this simulation we're going to use our internal 3 degree of freedom point mass round earth model based in MATLAB and Simulink. And if that just sounds like a lot of information coming at you, don't worry about it. Just look for other videos uh, we'll post soon talking about the different types of flight simulation models. So just roll with us here. Okay, so we're going to take the simulation output and we're going to put it in the TAC view for visualization. Okay, we need a scenario for our simulation now. So we have to think about how does the eye scanner get used. Well, it's, it's fast, it's got a big warhead. So you're going to use it typically for high value targets, things that you need to dispatch fast and with some certainty. Uh, so we're going to be attacking control centers, surface air missile sites, air bases, stuff like that. 
Okay, so we got to put the Iskander somewhere now. It doesn't really matter because it's mobile. I could launch the Iskander from a McDonald's parking lot if I wanted to. So we're going to put it in a random field next to a random road, and we're going to hit an airbase target 332 kilometers away. Now, this is based on a real scenario, but we're not going to divulge these locations, but you can probably figure them out for yourself. And we're going to be doing two flights for this video. The first flight is going to be straight from the launch site to the target, and the other flight is going to be an offset so we can look at the lateral maneuvering capability of the Iskander. Okay, we're joining the Iskander already in flight, and we've already started over on our pitch program. An old school ballistic missile like the Scud uh, can't pitch over very aggressively. It's because they use liquid propellants for their rocket motor. So essentially the rocket is nothing but a flying fuel tank. They do not tolerate side loads very well. So uh, a ballistic, old school ballistic missile, uh, space launch vehicles, they have to use what's called a gravity turn or a modified gravity turn, which is essentially what you try to do is minimize your aerodynamic loads while letting gravity turn you from the vertical over to the flat path angle that you need to be at at burnout. Now with the Iskander, it's short and stocky, it can take those side loads. Don't have to worry about it and we can have a much more aggressive pitch program. Okay, so we're approaching burnout. For a ballistic missile, this is a critical time of the flight. My velocity of my flight path angle, altitude have to be spot on. If they're not, that's seriously going to affect my accuracy downrange. So what a ballistic missile designer is going to do is as they approach the burnout condition, they're going to jump out of their regular pitch program and go into a terminal guidance scheme that gives them a finer level of control. Now the Iskander designers have an additional problem and it's that solid rocket motor. You just don't turn off solid rocket motors. They burn until they go through all of their propellant. So you're going to get some variability in burn time. Uh, you're also going to get some variability in thrust and all this has to get thrown in to the control algorithm sausage maker. Okay, we're approaching Apogee now. Now Apogee is your highest point in the trajectory and it's a byproduct of your velocity, flat path angle, and altitude at burnout. Now, as I said earlier, the Iskander uses depressed trajectories, and there's probably a couple reasons for that. Uh, first and foremost is I'm coming in low to the target. If there is an air defense radar at that target that's looking for me, if I come in low, it's going to delay their opportunity to find me. The other reason is I'm deeper down the atmosphere where the air is it's, it's more dense. That gives me more aerodynamic lift to work with if I need to maneuver. Okay, we're passing through 27 kilometers in altitude. In you know, flight simulation, uh, we generally consider 7,500 kilometers as the upper extent of the atmosphere, but the vast majority of it's below 30 kilometers. And so as we punch through that 30, 30 kilometer barrier and we're approaching you know 20 kilometers, we're really gonna start seeing air density increase and we're gonna start seeing our aerodynamic drag increase and we're gonna start slowing down. At some point here, we're gonna start terminal guidance so we can home in on the target. If we think they might have ballistic missile defense there, we're gonna put in some pre-programmed maneuvers. In this case, what we're doing here is a vertical weave or porpoise maneuver. We can do the same kind of maneuver in the lateral plane, and we can do them both at the same time and produce a corkscrew. Uh, ideally, you'd like to randomize these maneuvers. That way, it just makes it really hard on the ballistic missile defense to try to figure out where you're going. Okay, we're around 10 kilometers out now, and we'll just watch it to the end. Okay, don't read too much into the accuracy of the simulation. We use a much simpler guidance and control model than the real missile. I mean, the real missile's got inertial navigation. It's uh, satellite-aided with GPS and GLONASS, and it also uses uh, digital scene mapping for terminal guidance. So it's using its radar to look out and, and compare the returns against a image of what the target should look like. And reportedly, the Russians have a secure data link on the missile, so they can change the target in flight from either the ground or an aircraft. So it's pretty cool stuff. Okay, for our offset case, what we're going to do is we're going to, we put in a five-degree error in the launch azimuth, and that's the red missile. We also included the green missile, which is the, the, the last flight we just looked at. It's direct from the launch site to the target. 
Now, during most of the boost phase and mid-course phase, there's not a lot of difference in these missiles. So at some point here, we're going to go into fast forward. That way we can get to the terminal phase of the flight. Okay, we're about 70 kilometers out from the target right now. We got about 25 kilometers of cross range air that we're going to have to correct. So here in a bit, we're going to turn on the guidance system and we're going to make a hard right turn towards the target. As you can see, we've got a lot of velocity. We've got a lot of air density to work with and the missile swings over on target. No problem. Now, if you pay attention uh, up to your right, you'll see the green track, the green missile and it's going to come into the target here in a bit. Uh, what happens is obviously with the red missile we had to fly a longer distance so it's going to take us a little bit longer to get to the uh, to the target and it's going to cost us a little bit of velocity. And that generally is not that too much of a problem but if I'm a penetrator and I got to get down to something buried you know that you know a couple hundred meters per second difference in the impact velocity could make a difference. And that wraps it up for this episode. Hope you found it entertaining and educational. And if you did, hit that like and subscribe button. I'd appreciate it. And uh, so you can stay in touch with us. We'll be coming with more videos, especially the Iskanders. We want to take a look at those cruise missiles sometime in the future.